is the audiobook for Lennon Rediscovered, What is to be Done in Context by Lars T. Lee. My name is Cliff Connolly, and I will be reading the text aloud. Quote, The basic mistake made by people who polemicize with what is to be done at the present time is that they tear this production completely out of a specific historical context, out of a specific and by now long past period and the development of our party. End quote. Lenin, 1907. And a sower went forth, sowing seeds. This image from the Gospels unexpectedly turns up in Stodilet, a political pamphlet published just over a century ago as part of an internecine struggle over policy and leadership within the ranks of the fledgling Social Democratic Party of Russia. The parable of the sower points directly to the disputed issues in this struggle. All sides agreed on the task of sowing the seeds of the social democratic message among the workers. All sides were confident that the seeds would ultimately bear fruit in revolutionary action by the workers. But many difficult choices remained. What is the best way to spread the seeds in autocratic Russia? What parts of the message will strike root immediately, and what parts will fall on barren ground? What kind of conditions are propitious for sowing the seed, and how can they be attained? The author kept his identity hidden by using a recently coined pseudonym, yet his political profile was clear to any perceptive reader. Here was a Russian revolutionary activist inspired by the mighty Social Democratic Party of Germany and determined to import as much of the model as was possible under the very different conditions of autocratic Russia. He resolutely opposed the skeptical voices in Russia who expressed doubts about the applicability of this model. He was confident that the Russian workers were rapidly acquiring a revolutionary outlook, so much so that he promised the young and inexperienced social democratic activists in Russia that they could accomplish miracles by preaching the revolutionary message. At the center of his political program was a passionate insistence on the overriding necessity of bringing political freedom to Russia. Stodilet had a solid success among the narrow audience to whom it was addressed. Nevertheless, the responses to the questions posed in the pamphlet were strongly tied to the concrete conditions of Russia's social democratic movement in 1901 and 2. So, the book was read widely only for a brief period. In 1903, the Russian Social Democrats created a national party organization of sorts. In 1905, a revolution transformed the political landscape in Russia. Stodilet was remembered, if at all, as a salvo in the pamphlet wars of yesteryear. Even the author of the pamphlet never referred to it after 1907. In 1917, this author, one Vladimir Ulyanov, who wrote under the pseudonym in Lenin, became the founder of the new political system of Soviet Russia. Since this political system lasted for most of the rest of the century, and since both the achievements and crimes of this system shocked and awed the world during its existence, much attention was directed toward the beliefs and outlook of the system's founder. Eventually, the spotlight was turned on the long-forgotten pamphlet Stodilet, especially after the late 1920s when the Soviet government made Lenin's major works available in the major European languages. The title chosen for the English translation of Stodilet was What is to be Done. Here, it was felt by many in the West, was the key to it all, the source of the beliefs that led to so grandiose a political experiment. What is to be done became enshrined in the textbooks as the founding document of Bolshevism. In the words of one of the most prominent American experts on Soviet Russia, the argument and flavor of what is to be done have remained embedded in the values and beliefs of the Soviet system. They are evident in the pronouncement of Khrushchev as they were in those of Stalin and Lenin. Thus, what is to be done became everybody's introduction to Lenin's beliefs, and a basic teaching tool for understanding the essence of Bolshevism. There could hardly have been a worse choice. What is to be done was written to score off some very specific opponents and to advocate some very specific policies that were relevant only for a fleeting moment. It certainly was not written with the intention of making Lenin's basic beliefs clear to readers decades later. If we want to pry out these beliefs, we must go the circuitous route of deducing them from his policy choices and his arguments in the context of the assumptions he shared with his intended readership. And yet this information is nowhere available in English or indeed in any language so that even learned specialists wrestle with the text and fail to pin it down. 
how pedagogically perverse to confront the beginner with a text that should frighten the expert. The experts regarded what is to be done as the founding document of Bolshevism, the book where Lenin first revealed the essence of his outlook. But even the experts worked without a proper knowledge of context, particularly the large context of international social democracy and the small context of the polemical infighting among Russian social democrats in late 1901. To speak plainly, they misread what is to be done and therefore misunderstood Lenin, and then successfully raised up this image of Lenin to textbook status. As a result, the textbook status of what is to be done is the main barrier to a serious rethinking of Lenin, since everybody thinks they have a basic idea of what Lenin stood for. But this barrier can turn into a bridge if we make the effort to put the book into context. The aim of this commentary, and new translation, is to provide the basic background information needed to do this. We will then literally rediscover a Lenin who is close to the complete opposite of the Lenin of the textbooks. Lenin, a Russian social democrat. Although what is to be done is focused on certain specific issues, the basic beliefs that animate it are the same ones reflected in all of Lenin's writing at least prior to World War I. These beliefs can be summed up by using the label Lenin certainly would have used for himself, a Russian social democrat. He must be thought of as a social democrat because his fundamental inspiration was the social democratic workers' movement in Western Europe. He must be thought of as a Russian social democrat because his fundamental project was to help build a party in Russia that was as much like the Western social democratic parties as conditions allowed, and where conditions did not allow, to change them by the revolutionary overthrow of the Tsar. I have coined the term Erfurtian to describe the bundle of beliefs, institutional models, and political strategies that constituted orthodox Marx-based social democracy. Erfurt was the German town where the Sozialdemokratische Partei Deutschland, or SPD, held a congress in 1891 at which they celebrated their victory over Bismarck's repressive anti-socialist law and also adopted a new program. An Erfurtian is someone who accepts the SPD as a model party, accepts the Erfurt program as an authoritative statement of the social democratic mission, and accepts Karl Kautsky's tremendously influential commentary on the Erfurt program as an authoritative definition of social democracy. On all counts, Lenin was a passionate Erfurtian. The self-defined mission of social democracy was to make the workers aware of their own world historical mission, namely, to conquer state power as a class and use it to introduce socialism. To borrow an image from Kautsky, the Social Democrats were bringing good news to the proletariat, and they confidently expected the proletariat to respond, if not immediately, then in the near future, with acceptance and enthusiasm. In order to carry out their mission, the Social Democrats created a party of a new type, dedicated to bringing enlightenment and organization to the proletariat. As embodied in the SPD, this new type of party possessed a clear commitment to the final goal of socialism. It was centralized and disciplined, it was as democratic as possible, and it was organized on a nationwide scale, allowing effective use of specialization and division of labor. Lenin observed all this from Russia and wanted to be part of it, but there was a big and obvious obstacle to applying the social democratic model to Russia. This obstacle was not Russia's backward industrial development and relatively small size of its urban proletariat. There was plenty of work for social democrats to do even with this relatively small proletariat. No, the obstacle was the absence of political freedom. Political freedom was light and air to social democracy. Without political freedom, the vigorous political participation, the organization on a national scale, the flourishing press, in fact, all the ways by which social democracy sought to enlighten and organize the proletariat for its world historical mission, were impossible. Lenin is often pictured as impatiently telling naive Russian activists that a democratic mass movement in the Western style was impossible under czarist repression, but nobody was that naive. Everyone was aware of the obvious fact that a full application of the social democratic model was only possible after the overthrow of czarism. The real debate was over whether the model could be applied at all to czarist Russia, and if so, 
To what extent? Was something resembling a mass movement even possible under these circumstances? An affirmative answer required some very confident assumptions about workers' receptivity to the social democratic message, and about the ability of underground activists to build and sustain a nationwide political organization, one that could both put down roots in the worker milieu and escape destruction at the hands of the police. The debate over these questions was essentially an empirical one, a political judgment about what was and was not feasible in Russia. The terms of the debate changed over the years as a real-life social democratic underground organization was built up in the mid-1890s and as the opportunities and limitations of underground organization became more clear. In each of the various clashes over these issues within Russian social democracy, Lenin can be easily located. He is always on the side making the most confident assumptions about the empirical possibility of a mass underground social democratic movement. Among the Russian revolutionaries, Marxists were more confident than populists in the mid-1890s. Among the Marxists, the Orthodox were more confident than the economists. Among the Orthodox, the Iskra group was more confident than their main leadership rival, the Rabochi Dila group. Among the Iskraites, the Bolsheviks were more confident than the Mensheviks. Among the Bolsheviks, Lenin was more confident than many of the factions underground Praktiki. Much of the following commentary is devoted to describing these clashes and prying out the empirical assumptions underlying the various positions taken. On what might Russian social democrats base their confidence about the viability of a mass movement under police state conditions? One source was a particular reading of The History of All Countries to employ a phrase often used by Lenin in this context. In other words, the inspiring example of Western social democracy. The working class in Western Europe was also scattered and disorganized at the beginning, it also suffered under repressive conditions, and yet social democracy was able to win it over and build it into a mighty political force. Confidence could also be based on optimistic assumptions about the receptivity of Russian workers to the social democratic message. Lenin generally argued that the advanced workers were already committed social democrats, and that these advanced workers were in an ideal position to spread the message further, since they would be accepted by other workers as their natural leaders. A relatively confident judgment could also be grounded in optimism about the survival ability of underground organizations. Underground committees were continually destroyed by the police. Three or four months was a typical lifespan. Open communication between local organizations was impossible, while strikes, demonstrations, and petition campaigns were all illegal. In order to have any confidence at all about the stability of underground organizations, you had to make some fairly heroic assumptions about a continual supply of activists, about their dedication, about their ability to outwit the police, about the possibility of setting down protective roots in the worker milieu. Lenin made all these assumptions. The very fact that he campaigned to raise the professionalism of the underground activists showed that he thought that they were capable of honing their skills and that this would have a payoff in survival value, opinions by no means universally shared. Finally, confidence could be based on the possible impact that a mass underground movement guided by social democracy could make on the rest of Russian society. If Russia was entering into a period of revolutionary crisis, if almost all of Russian society was turning in anger against the Tsar, if everyone was waiting for some sort of mass action against the Tsar before revealing their own radical dissatisfaction, if an underground organization would receive support not only from the workers but from all groups, then, indeed, even a pathetically small and weak social democratic organization could make a major impact and genuinely lead a revolutionary transformation of Russia. For Lenin, all of these ifs were facts. As is often observed, Lenin devoted all his energy to the revolution. But, in itself, this observation is so abstract that it is quite misleading. Lenin was working for the upcoming anti-Tsarist revolution that would destroy absolutism and introduce political freedom to Russia. One way of putting it is to say that he was working for a bourgeois revolution. This phrase, accurate enough as far as it goes, misleadingly puts the emphasis on what were, for Lenin, the negative and limited aspects of the upcoming revolution. At this point in his career, Lenin was a passionate advocate of political freedom, in particular, 
what might be called the five S's. Svaboda Slova, Sayuzov, Sabranya, and Stajik. Freedom of speech, association, assembly, and strikes. If you were willing to fight for political freedom, you were Lenin's ally, even if you were hostile to socialism. If you downgraded the goal of political freedom in any way, you were Lenin's foe, even if you were a committed socialist. Attachment to political freedom confirms his Erfurtian loyalties and his confident assumptions about Russia. Marx, Engels, and Kautsky, Lenin's three central authorities, all insisted that political freedom was light and air to the proletariat and its struggle. Political freedom was not an end in itself, but it was an absolutely necessary means to accomplishing the socialist goal. Bourgeois political freedom was thus much too important to be left to the bourgeoisie, and so Kautsky's authoritative writings sketched out a role for social democracy as leader of the whole people in the fight for expanded political freedom. The rise of Marx-based social democracy among the revolutionaries in Russia depended crucially on the growing conviction that a political revolution had to precede a social revolution. The populist revolutionaries of the 1870s had by and large been very pessimistic about the effects of political freedom. Would not political freedom simply give the bourgeoisie greater access to the masses, thus allowing them to corrupt and mislead them? And indeed, anyone who is skeptical about the revolutionary inclinations of the workers would be ill-advised to fight for a political freedom that would benefit conservatives and liberals at least as much as socialists, and probably more. But this certainty evidently did not bother Lenin, as he single-mindedly worked for a revolution to destroy absolutism. Lenin's Erfurtian loyalties and confident assumptions about Russia can be found in everything he produced, before, during, and after the writing of what is to be done. And they structure the whole argument of what is to be done as well. In order to see this clearly, we must look at the micro-context, the situation Lenin faced in late 1901 when he sat down to write what is to be done. Lenin's urgency and polemical zeal have led most readers to suppose Lenin was reacting to a crisis. His argument is put in a strikingly different light when we realize he was reacting to an opportunity. The fundamental cause of this sense of opportunity was the approaching revolutionary storm in Russia. The young social democrat Boris Gorev had the Rip Van Winkle experience of returning to European Russia in August 1902 after several years in Siberian exile. When he had left Russia in 1897, a single strike in Petersburg was cause for social democratic joy. When he returned, the entire country seemed on the brink of the long-awaited overthrow of the Tsar. When Gorev met his younger brother Mikhail, now known as Lieber and one of the leaders of the Jewish Bund, he was struck by his brother's assurance that the time of revolution had finally arrived. This sense of excitement was widely shared. One émigré newspaper was entitled On the Eve. El Nadezhdin, a social democratic critic of Iskra, entitled his group's journal Eve of Revolution. In the lectures that he gave in America in 1903 and 4, Paul Milyakov told his audience that Russia was in a state of revolutionary ferment. The book based on these lectures, aptly titled Russia and Its Crisis, particularly stressed the role of worker militancy in creating the atmosphere of revolutionary storm. Social Democrats such as Lenin were even more encouraged by the rise of worker militancy and its galvanizing effect on the rest of Russian society. Always in the background of what is to be done is the sense of excitement vividly expressed by Vera Zasulich, one of Lenin's fellow editors in the underground newspaper Iskra, when she described workers' demonstrations to German readers. Quote, The new revolutionary Russia is the growth of revolutionary courage and the refusal to submit to the powers that be. It is the wide dissemination of illegal literature and the constant demand for it. It is the speed and the ease with which the ranks of organized social democracy pulls together and grows, despite the countless arrests. It is the street demonstrations themselves, carried out by crowds of people many thousand strong who support the protests of the students. It is the huge masses during the present year, 1902, who made the watchword down with the autocracy heard all over Russia. And this watchword was not rejected by the rest of the population. All of this compels those loyal to the government and the government itself to understand just how stormily and uncontrollably the number of their enemies is growing, just how irreconcilable are the contradictions between its hired defenders and the mass of the people. End quote. All this activity strengthened the position of Lenin's Iskra group vis-a-vis -vis its social democratic rivals. 
As Milyakov put it in Russia and its crisis, the success of the orthodox Marxists grouped around Iskra is easily explained by the fact that their tendency coincided with the ascending line of the whole movement, and was powerfully supported by the whole trend of the increasing revolutionism of the Russian socialists. Lenin was delighted by these developments. In late 1901, the very time that he was writing What is to be Done, he wrote, quote, we should draw new faith in the universal power of the worker movement guided by us when we see how the excitement in the advanced revolutionary class is transmitted to the other classes and strata of society. How this excitement leads not only to an unbelievable upsurge of revolutionary spirit among the students, but also to the awakening in the village that is now beginning. End quote. But if economism, the downgrading of political freedom as an urgent goal for Russian social democracy, was on the rocks by 1901, why did Lenin devote what is to be done to conducting a polemic against it? The answer to this question is simple. He did not. The polemic in what is to be done is not against economism. Rather, it is a polemic which uses economism as a stick to beat the main leadership rivals of Iskra, the Rabochi Dila group. Lenin correctly assumed that if he could pin the economist's label on his rivals, they would be discredited. The Rabochi Dila group loudly, and as I think justifiably, denied they had anything to do with economism. In the close to 50 articles Lenin wrote for Iskra during the years 1900 to 1903, polemics directed against economism are very hard to find, whereas polemics against terrorism or nationalism within the party are prominent. The polemics directed against the Rabochi Dila group are, for the most part, confined to two short chapters tacked onto the original plan for the book due to circumstances described in chapter 5. The business part of what is to be done consists of three long chapters in which Lenin makes the case for his positive policy proposals. These proposals include the urgency of a particular agitation technique, political indictments, the urgency of transcending the prevailing artisanal limitations in party organizations, and the urgency of using a party newspaper as a tool in tying together the existing local organizations into an effective national organization. But, again, all this urgency sprang out of a sense of opportunity, not of crisis. From Lenin's point of view, the groundwork of a national party organization had been laid. The viability of a truly mass underground movement had been demonstrated. All that remained was to take the next logical step toward unification on a Russia-wide scale. In his first, although unpublished, presentation of his policy package in 1899, Lenin describes the past achievements and vast future potential of underground social democracy. Quote, The Russian worker movement finds itself at the present time in a transitional period, a brilliant beginning that saw social democratic organizations of the workers in the western regions, Petersburg, Moscow, Kiev, and other towns, was crowned by the formation of the Russian Social Democratic Worker Party, spring 1898. After taking this giant step forward, social democracy seemed to have exhausted all its forces and fell back to its previous fragmented work of separate local organizations. The party did not go out of existence. It only turned inward to gather up its forces and put the work of uniting all Russian social democrats on a secure basis. Local social democratic work in Russia achieved a rather high level. The seeds of social democratic ideas were sown everywhere in Russia. Worker leaflets, that primary form of social democratic literature, are now familiar to all Russian workers, from Petersburg to Krasnoyarsk, from the Caucasus to the Urals. All that is lacking is precisely bringing together all this local work into the work of one party. End quote. Because of this underlying sense of urgency, opportunity, and excitement, what is to be done had inspiring qualities that communicated itself to many of its first readers above and beyond its angry polemics. One of these first readers, in Valentinov, has left the following account all the more valuable because Valentinov broke with Lenin very early. Quote, in his pamphlet on the Kiev Revolutionary Movement of 1901-3, published in 1926 by the Kiev section of the Institute of Party History, Vakar wrote the following. Valentinov, a student of the Polytechnic, took an extremely active part in the work of the Social Democratic Committee at that time. He was an athletically built, healthy, and cheerful youth. His energetic and expansive nature always drove him to the most dangerous and different enterprises which demanded daring and determination, and sometimes skill and physical strength. Struggle, risk, and danger attracted Comrade Valentinov. Apart from the word youth, I looked younger than my age, 
the description is broadly correct. I only quote it here because it applied equally well to all of us in those years. Daring and determination were common to all of us. For this reason, what is to be done struck just the right chord with us, and we were only too eager to put its message into practice. In this sense, one may say, we were 100% Leninists at that time. End quote. Worry about workers. The Russian Marxists faced a problem that had plagued radicals in the 1870s and would be a perennial obstacle for them. The political inertia of the masses. If the Narod, the people, revered by many Russian radicals, refused to be budged towards activism, how could the revolution ever be made? Lenin turned to the issue of the masses' political inertia and analyzed it most comprehensively in 1902 in the pamphlet What is to be Done. This statement by the distinguished American historian Abraham Asher brings us up short. Could Asher be talking about the same Lenin I have just described? Could he be talking about the same what is to be done? I described a confident and excited Lenin who wrote what is to be done in the midst of a revolutionary upsurge. Asher describes a gloomy, anxious Lenin trying to figure out what went wrong. We are indeed talking about the same Lenin and the same what is to be done, and furthermore, Asher here expresses the outlook of a strong consensus of informed experts. I call this consensus the textbook interpretation because, at least from the mid-1950s, this reading of what is to be done has found its way into textbooks of political science and of Russian history, and from there, into almost any secondary account that has reason to touch on Lenin. The two or three famous passages that form the textual basis of this reading are endlessly recycled from textbooks to popular history to specialized monograph and back again. In my description of the textbook interpretation, I will restrict myself to those writers who backed up their reading with factual historical research. These writers can be divided into two groups, the academics and the activists. The academic historians who laid the basis of the textbook interpretation constituted the first generation in post-war Soviet studies. Leopold Hamsen, Alfred G. Meyer, Adam Ullman, Leonard Shapiro, John Keep, Samuel Barron, Alan Wildman, Israel Getzler, Abraham Asher, Richard Pipes, and Jonathan Frankel. Although not full-time Soviet specialists, Barrington Moore and Herbert Marcuse also belong on this list. The monographs written by these specialists, starting in the early 1950s and petering out in the early 1970s, are dedicated to various aspects of the revolutionary and labor movement in the period when Lenin wrote What is to be Done. What is to be Done itself plays a somewhat strange role in these books. On the one hand, there is no extensive examination of it as a text. On the other hand, What is to be Done invariably provides what can be called the narrative hinge of these books. It is in and through what is to be done that Lenin first reveals himself and creates Bolshevism almost as a demiurge. In the 1970s, activists in the Trotskyist tradition began to issue their own historical-based readings of what is to be done. Writers such as Tony Cliff, John Molyneux, and more recently Paul LeBlanc wrote partly in reaction to the academic specialists, but mainly out of a desire to bring Leninist lessons to the movement of their own day. Their attitude to Lenin is very favorable, but not completely uncritical. Despite the political differences between them and the academics, there is enough overlap in their interpretation of what is to be done to justify including the activists among the advocates of the textbook interpretation. The activist take on the academic interpretation can be summed up as yes, but. Yes, what is to be done does show a mistrust of workers, emphasis on the role of intellectuals and so on, but... First of all, Lenin had a point, even if a one-sided point, and second, he radically changed his emphasis later. I shall describe the academic reading of what is to be done, and then the activist reaction. The fundamental tenet of the textbook interpretation is that what is to be done expresses Lenin's worry about workers. In this book, Lenin reveals a distrust of the mass, a conviction that socialist consciousness was given to few. Lenin's pessimistic assumption about the workers' natural reformist inclinations is what drove him to make his other theoretical and organizational innovations. The textual basis for this description of Lenin's outlook are his pronouncements on the subject of spontaneity and consciousness. Lenin was preoccupied with this question. He feared the spontaneous development of the workers' movement. He demanded that the workers' movement be diverted from its natural course and be directed from without by non-workers, in fact, by bourgeois revolutionary intellectuals. 
It is hardly an exaggeration to say that the textual basis for this portrait of Lenin is not just one book, not just one chapter in this book, not just two famous paragraphs from this chapter that are inevitably quoted, but three words found in these paragraphs. Spontaneity, divert, and from without. One word in Russian. Lenin's worry about workers was caused by a crisis, a development that threatened his view of the world and poisoned his previous optimism. Disputes over the exact nature of this crisis have led to a major division within the textbook interpretation. The majority view locates Lenin's conversion to the rise of revisionism. Deep down inside, Lenin agreed with the revisionists that the workers were becoming more and more reformist, less and less socialist. A very common trope is that Lenin was a secret revisionist himself. Adam Ulam, the Harvard political science professor who was instrumental in making what is to be done a standard textbook item, put it this way, quote, Although the argument is directed at German revisionism and its alleged Russian followers, there is the basic agreement between Lenin and Eduard Bernstein. The forces of history are not making of the workers a revolutionary class. The spontaneous organization of the workers leads them not to revolution, but to a struggle for economic and professional improvement. Why, then, is Bernstein revisionist and Lenin an orthodox Marxist? Because Bernstein believes in the Workers' Party following the inclination of the workers and bowing to the inherent laborism of the industrialized worker, whereas Lenin believes in forcible conversion of the worker to revolutionary Marxism. End quote. The other explanation for Lenin's turn to pessimism might be called the uppity worker explanation, or, more gravely, the anti-worker file explanation. According to Reginald Zelnick, at the end of the 1890s, Lenin, quote, had learned from afar that some of Russia's most militant, dedicated workers were now engaged in the dramatic, though in some ways ambivalent, rejection of intelligentsia tutelage, a worker file trend that echoed trends in other parts of Europe, and one that Lenin fought with all his heart, end quote. The scholars who pioneered this explanation of Lenin's crisis, Alan Wildman, Zelnick, and Gerald Sir, do not actually call Lenin a worker-phobe, but they do see him as driven by a profound unease, even outrage, at the sight of workers taking their fate into their own hands. A desire to exclude workers from leadership positions is the natural result. Lenin's newfound pessimism, whatever motivated it, caused him to reject the more optimistic Marxism of Western social democracy, with its deterministic faith in the spontaneous revolutionary inclinations of the workers. Lenin is quite ready to reinterpret Marx while claiming, of course, that he is merely following the letter of the doctrine. Others more charitably allow that Lenin may have sincerely believed he was orthodox and that, therefore, he was only an unconscious heretic. Lenin's rejection of Marxism, as understood by Western social democracy, led logically to his rejection of the popular, open, and more or less democratically organized parties of Western Europe and the huge trade union-affiliated German party in particular and therefore his reversion to populist conspiratorial ideas of revolution-mongering. This reversion to populist models constituted a profound innovation within the Marxist tradition. As Bertram Wolff put it in 1961, quote, In two pamphlets and a number of articles published between 1902 and 04, Lenin had been hammering away at his new organization plan for a party of a new type, that is, one differing fundamentally from all previous Marxian parties, whether those founded while Marx and Engels were alive or since. End quote. The party of a new type was to be hyper centralized, confined to a few professional revolutionaries recruited from among the intelligentsia, and dedicated to conspiracy. Naturally, these innovations caused a huge split within Russian social democracy, dividing those who remained true to the social democracy of civilized Europe and those who updated the traditions of barbarous Russia. Part of the attraction of the textbook interpretation is the compelling narrative of this fateful split between Bolshevik and Menshevik, a split whose huge stakes were only vaguely sensed by the participants themselves. The first major, and in many ways still most compelling, statement of the textbook interpretation was Bertram Wolff's Three Who Made a Revolution, published in 1948, in which he says, quote, The real issue was between economists and Marxists, then between Mensheviks and Bolsheviks, then between workers' opposition and Lenin, between Tomsky and Stalin, changing forms of protean battle between westernizer and Slavophile. 
One path led closer to the parties and trade unions of the West, which were democratically organized, comfortably adopted to the sizable legality prevented them, and long since devoid of insurrectionary spirit, except as a banner for festal occasions. The other led to concentration on conspiracy and insurrection under the leadership of a self-selected, rigidly centralized, secret and conspirative band of revolutionary intellectuals under a self-appointed leader formed on the pattern of the early professional revolutionaries of the Narodna Volya, end quote. Putting all the assertions of the textbook interpretation together, we realize that what is to be done is a profound theoretical and organizational innovation, the charter document of Bolshevism and the ultimate source of Stalinism. Given the strong link thus forged between what is to be done and Stalinism, the textbook interpretation has little motivation to bring out the centrality of political freedom in Lenin's platform. The specialists who wrote about the political history of Russian social democracy in this period were surely aware that Lenin and the Iskra group strongly insisted on the urgency of political freedom for Russia, but they somehow managed to talk about it in such a way that nobody else knew it. I certainly did not. They put as little emphasis on political freedom as possible while putting as much emphasis on any hint, often very tenuous indeed, that Lenin was impatient, wanted to skip stages, leap to socialism, and so forth. One sometimes gets the impression that Lenin's revolution-mongering in favor of political freedom was not quite seemly. His insistence on political freedom begins to look captious and sectarian. Richard Pipes tells us that Lenin demanded revolution, despite the fact that by 1900, Russia was moving towards a mature trade unionism, and this at a time when trade unions and even strikes were illegal in Russia, and one of the main motives for Iskra's insistence on revolution was precisely to make them legal. The activist interpretation advanced by Cliff, Molyneux, LeBlanc, and others vehemently rejects the link between what is to be done and Stalinism. Their overall portrait of Lenin contrasts strongly with the one presented by the academic tradition. Yet, on the specific issue of what is to be done, the contrast with the academic tradition is less striking than the overlap. With minor differences of emphasis, the activist writers tell the following story. Marx-based social democracy in Western Europe had a fatalistic and deterministic view of political organization. This view had roots in Marx's own optimistic evolutionism. The great breakthrough to a vanguard conception of the party came with Lenin and what is to be done. Although Lenin himself was unaware of his originality and thought he was applying standard Marxist conceptions. In making his breakthrough, Lenin was led to make formulations about spontaneity and the role of intellectuals that were one-sided and therefore false. But this was just Lenin's way of doing things. He was always bending the stick too far in the particular direction he needed to emphasize at a particular point. In 1902, the stick needed bending toward the importance of centralism, and so Lenin emphasized centralism at every turn. Lenin's formulation led to the split with Russian social democracy because the Mensheviks remained loyal to the standard social democratic position of a passive, fatalistic, deterministic, economist confusion between party and class. But Lenin's own views continued to develop, particularly in response to the revolution of 1905. Quote, in the face of the enormous and spontaneous revolutionary achievements of the Russian working class, the tone of Lenin's writings changes completely. The break with the economistic fatalism that was achieved in what is to be done and one step forward is maintained and developed, but freed of the elitist foundation that Lenin had at first given it. End quote. Lenin moved so far ahead of the other Bolsheviks that when he tried to get more workers on party committees in 1905, his own followers rejected him, imbued as they were with the spirit of what is to be done. Thus, the activists. When we compare this account given by the activists to the standard academic account, we see that the two sides agree that Lenin made an unwittingly original breakthrough in the area of party organization. The new vanguard type of party constitutes a dramatic break with Western traditions. The difference here is only one of evaluation. The academic writers prefer the mass democratic parties of the West, whilst the activist rejects these parties as over-representative and insufficiently revolutionary. The two sides also agree that Lenin's formulations on the question of spontaneity and consciousness are the heart of what is to be done. In this case, the activists, to a large extent, subscribe to the evaluation of these formulations as unfortunately elitist. The difference here is that the activists claim that Lenin himself later realized these formulations were one-sided, so they cannot be said to constitute the heart of Lenin's outlook. 
Finally, both sides agree that the message sent out by what is to be done was, worry about workers. So intense was this message that only the mighty events of 1905 caused Lenin to change his mind. And even then, his followers were determined to keep workers off the committees. As should already be clear, I reject all the central propositions of the textbook interpretation. The keynote of Lenin's outlook was not worry about workers, but exhilaration about workers. The formulations about spontaneity are not the heart of what is to be done, but a tacked-on polemical sally if Lenin's opponent Boris Krichevsky had not used the word in his critique of Iskra published in September 1901, it would not have appeared in what is to be done published a few months later. These formulations are confusing, unedifying, and should be bracketed until all other evidence about Lenin's outlook is considered. What is to be done was not a gloomy response to a crisis, however defined, but an exuberant response to an opportunity. What is to be done did not reject the Western model of a social democratic party, but invoked this model at every turn. Lenin certainly advocated a vanguard party, for this was the common understanding of what social democracy was all about. Lenin thus did not revert to the populist tradition in any way. What is to be done did not advocate hypercentralism or an elite conspiratorial party restricted to professional revolutionaries from the intelligentsia. The positions advanced in it were not the cause of the party split in 1904. The centrality of political freedom in Lenin's platform makes it impossible to draw a direct link between what is to be done and Stalinism. How is it that such a wide and long-standing consensus has, in my view, gone so wrong? The political outlook of the various writers can hardly be decisive given the strange coalition just observed between pro-Lenin and anti-Lenin authors. One explanation for this coalition is that it goes back to a similar coalition in 1904. At that time, two heroes of the activist tradition, Lev Trotsky and Rosa Luxemburg, were Mensheviks, or at any rate, were prepared to work with the Mensheviks in combating Lenin. Even today, a few oft-quoted sentences from Trotsky and Luxembourg are among the main props of the textbook interpretation. Another reason is the common fascination with the question of Lenin's attitude towards spontaneity. For a variety of reasons to be set out later, this is a profitless exercise. One ill effect of the exclusive focus on this issue is the exiguous textual basis used to ascertain Lenin's views, since Lenin simply did not talk about this topic very much. Two passages to the exclusion of much else in chapter 2 of what is to be done, one chapter to the exclusion of much else in what is to be done as a whole, one book to the exclusion of almost everything else Lenin wrote in the Iskra period of 1900 to 03, no wonder there are some surprises when a more extensive range of writings is taken into account. Lenin cannot be understood just by reading Lenin. Three other vital contexts have been largely overlooked by the textbook interpretation. The first is the context of international social democracy, what I call the Erfurtian outlook. The two wings of the textbook interpretation have different motives for neglect of this context. Specialists on Russia enjoy tracing the Russian roots of Lenin's thinking and tend not to have a detailed knowledge of, say, German social democracy. Trotskyist activists have inherited a disdain for the Second International, and for Kautsky in particular, that is so total as to preclude any serious inquiry into their actual views. A second context is the growing revolutionary storm in Russia at the turn of the century. Of course, any informed specialist is aware of the crisis in Russia that was gathering momentum in 1901 and 2, but this never seems to have any impact on their presentation of Lenin as a worried man singing a worried song. At the time Lenin wrote his book, the entire spectrum of revolutionary opinion was encouraged and energized by the willingness of workers to demonstrate their political dissatisfaction in the streets. This growing excitement has been leached out of the standard picture of social democrats wringing their hands over, in Asher's words, the political inertia of the masses. A third context is the shared assumptions among the participants in the polemical infighting within Russian social democracy. If we do not realize that everybody took for granted that the SPD model could only be applied to Russia in a severely distorted underground version, we will miss the import of Lenin's proposals. If we do not realize that Lenin fully expected all his readers, and even his opponents, to regard economism as a very bad thing indeed, we will miss the import of his polemics, and so forth. Although I cannot help being worried 
by the impressive array of experts who support the textbook interpretation, there are two circumstances that encourage me. The first is that when the more knowledgeable and conscientious advocates of the textbook interpretation try to bring in a wider range of evidence in support of Lennon's worry about workers, they regularly end up with a thoroughly incoherent picture. The second is that there exists a solid counter-tradition on what is to be done, so much so that I can safely say I am rediscovering Lennon, rather than presenting an original new picture. Let us take a look at these two sources of encouragement in turn. Flip-flops and stick bending. Every interpretation of a complicated and messy reality faces anomalies, that is, data that at least on the surface gives rise to serious problems for their proposed interpretation. My approach to what is to be done can be labeled the good news interpretation. Lenin believed that social democracy had a mission to carry to the workers the good news of their own world historical mission, and that furthermore, this message would be on the whole enthusiastically received and acted upon. Social democracy was needed and would be heeded. The anomaly for this interpretation consists of the famous formulations about combating spontaneity and so on. I deal with this anomaly first by laying out the massive evidence for my interpretation, and second, by giving reasons why the famous formulations do not, in fact, pose a serious threat. The worry about workers' interpretation also faces a long and grave list of anomalies. To start with, the views attributed to Lenin by the textbook interpretation are ridiculous and remarkably illogical. This is demonstrated quite insightfully and convincingly by Adam Ullam, a scholar who is instrumental in turning the worry about workers' interpretation into a textbook staple. Quote, To combat spontaneity, the literal statement sounds almost ridiculous, doubly so in the circumstances of its first formulation. Who is to divert the growing working movement in Russia from its natural course? A handful of revolutionaries, some of them in czarist jails, operating through a newspaper published abroad. But the statement contains the essence of Leninism, the perception that the natural development of material forces and the natural response of people to them will, in time, lead far away from Marx's expectations about the effects of industrialization on the worker. You do not jettison Marxism because it failed to predict the psychology of the worker in an advanced industrialized country. You improve and advance this psychology in the revolutionary direction by means of a party. A remarkably illogical performance. You reject the major premise of your ideology, yet you claim strict orthodoxy. Your argument is rationalistic and materialistic, and yet you set out, almost in Sorel-like fashion, to propagate the myth of revolution, the necessity of which you have just asserted the workers will feel less and less. End quote. Advocates of the textbook interpretation will sometimes admit that Lenin did not explicitly advance the views attributed to him, although this fact does not seem to worry them much. For example, Richard Pipes summarizes a Lenin article of 1899 by telling us that Lenin's unspoken assumption is that the majority of the population is actually or potentially reactionary, his unspoken conclusion that democracy leads to reaction. Pipes is absolutely right. These particular assumptions and conclusions are definitely unspoken. Lenin's spoken assumptions and conclusions, a subject which Pipes shows less interest in, are all about the majority of the population charging the citadel of the autocracy in order to achieve democratic political freedom as the necessary next step towards socialism. Direct evidence that Lenin held quite other views than the ones assigned to him are dealt with by making Lenin incoherent. In an important book in the academic tradition, Alfred Meyer's Leninism, we read that Lenin tended to assume that the working man was forever doomed to insufficient consciousness, no matter how miserable his conditions. Yet, again, precisely because Meyer is more informed and conscientious than most, he promptly starts to make Lenin incoherent. He immediately adds, As an orthodox Marxist, Lenin denied the revisionist thesis that the workers had lost their class consciousness or had never possessed it in the first place. But as a Leninist, he accepted it, at least as a short-run proposition. A little later, we read, While it is true that in the main he denied rationality to the working man, he did not maintain this attitude unhesitatingly. On the contrary, he more than once allowed himself to be led astray by an unusually optimistic appraisal of proletarian consciousness. 
Turning to the most recent and up-to-date scholarship in the worry about workers tradition, we find that it also insists, is forced to insist, on Lenin's incoherence. Earlier scholarship has often posited some sort of sudden conversion on Lenin's part prior to what is to be done, but lately the number of conversions and flip-flops and Lenin's outlook has dramatically increased. In independent studies, Robert Mayer and Anna Krilova both advance what I call a double flip-flop hypothesis. Lenin had a crisis of faith immediately before what is to be done, and then had a radical change of mind very soon thereafter, thus leaving what is to be done disconnected both to Lenin's past and his future. Krilova, for example, states that what is to be done's view of the workers is in striking contrast to Lenin's previous writings, that what is to be done itself is an encyclopedia of modernist doubt, and that soon after the publication, Lenin put an end to his doubts with a brand new view of the workers as motivated entirely by class instinct. Another way to dismiss anomalous evidence about Lenin's views is simply to claim that Lenin was consciously or unconsciously hypocritical. According to Reginald Zelnick, Lenin could not be fully explicit about his worry about workers because of the dangerous political implications of clarifying his real views, even to himself. The activist writers also talk as if they knew Lenin's beliefs better than he himself did. John Molyneux writes, for example, that Lenin at this stage, 1904, was not aware that he diverged in any fundamental way from social democratic orthodoxy, and therefore incorrectly identified himself with the mainstream of SPD luminaries such as Karl Kautsky and August Babel. We are left with the following picture. There was probably no one in Russia who had read in Kautsky's voluminous writings so attentively, extensively, and admiringly as Lenin, Yet he remained completely unaware that he diverged in fundamental ways from Kautsky. I am not sure whether we are supposed to explain this by Kautsky's deceitfulness, Lenin's inability to understand what he read, or Lenin's unawareness of his own beliefs. Bending the stick is the activist tradition's favorite device for explaining away anomalies. Of course, Lenin did tend to put exclusive emphasis at any one time on one or a few points. Certainly, we need to keep this in mind when we are trying to make sense of his pronouncements. Nevertheless, over-frequent recourse to this explanation ends up making Lenin look like a rather incompetent and incoherent leader. Tony Cliff is a great admirer of Lenin, and yet his picture of Lenin from 1895 to 1905 is not an attractive one. In 1895, Lenin thought class consciousness, including political consciousness, develops automatically from the economic struggle. A few years later, he veered away from that extreme belief, quote, It was fear of the danger to the movement occasioned by the rise of Russian economism and German revisionism in the second half of 1899 that motivated Lenin to bend the stick right over again, away from the spontaneous day-to-day -day fragmented economic struggle and towards the organization of a national political party. End quote. Lenin's bending of the stick right over to mechanical overemphasis on organization and what is to be done was quite useful operationally since the step now necessary was to arise, at least in the politically conscious section of the masses, a passion for political action. But, as Cliff himself makes clear, by the time Lenin sat down to write what is to be done in late 1901, economism was on the rocks and the workers were becoming the main active political opponents of czarism. Evidently, Lenin was so out of touch that he bent the stick exactly where it was not needed. Lenin's stick bending in what is to be done had unfortunate consequences, since he managed to convince the Bolshevik praktiki that it was unwise to allow workers on party committees. No doubt, these Bolsheviks did not yet realize their leader's habit of always exaggerating, and so took him seriously. When Lenin himself began to bend the stick in yet another direction, he could not convince the followers to relent. Lenin himself used the bend the stick image in some remarks he made about what is to be done. Given the importance of this image and commentary on what is to be done, especially in the activist tradition, we should be clear in our minds about exactly what it is that we take Lenin to be saying. There are two ways of understanding the bend the stick image. If a stick is bent in one direction, then you bend it in the other direction in order to get back to the center. In this case, you are explaining why you bent the stick in a certain direction and no other or, less figuratively, why you chose to make some points and not others. Or, alternatively, the stick 
is bent so firmly in one direction that in order to correct it, you must bend it too far in the other direction in the expectation that, upon release, it will revert to an upright position. Less figuratively, you exaggerate and overstate your case in order to get people's attention. Turning to Lenin's actual words, we find he never said he bent the stick too far. On the contrary, he said at the Second Congress in 1903, quote, We all know now that the economists bent the stick in one direction. In order to make the stick straight, it was necessary to bend the stick in the other direction, and that is what I did. I am sure that Russian social democracy will always straighten the stick that is bent by any kind of opportunism, and that our stick will therefore always be straight as possible and as ready as possible for action. End quote. It is not inconceivable that Lenin's outlook was indeed as incoherent as it is portrayed by many advocates of the textbook interpretation. Yet, as a matter of basic methodology, when trying to interpret a person's worldview, the assumption of incoherence should be our last resort, not our first. We wish to understand the outlook of people operating in a long-ago historical environment, who rely on all sorts of unfamiliar assumptions, who use language for intensely polemical purposes. On first or even second reading, their views may seem ridiculous, remarkably illogical, shot through with contradictions completely at odds with their earlier and later outlook, and such that even they are not conscious of their own views. If this is the result of our first and second reading, I urge a third or fourth one, coupled with a more concerted effort to uncover the unfamiliar assumptions governing their views and the situation they faced when making any particular expression of them. In any event, I find it a rather attractive feature of my own interpretation that it allows Lenin to know his own beliefs and to maintain a fundamental consistency in his outlook. These two points go together, since Lenin himself often asserted the fundamental continuity of his views, even in writings put forward as evidence of his flip-flops. They also make it possible to explain how what is to be done's first readers could see it as an inspiring expression of passionate and insistent revolutionary will in the words of Boris Gorev, a member of the text's original audience. One is inclined to doubt that Gorev and his fellows could have been inspired in this way by an encyclopedia of modernist doubt written in obfuscatory language by an anxious pessimist. Lenin Rediscovered So far, I have talked as if it were myself against the field. Fortunately, this is not the case. The present study is part of a tradition of what is to be done interpretation that stretches back to the time of its publication. Indeed, when we look at the long durée of what is to be done studies, the textbook interpretation appears to be in a minority position. We saw earlier how the textbook interpretation traces its lineage back to the 1904 pamphlets of Rosa Luxemburg and Lev Trotsky. There are some ironies associated with their iconic status as the prophets who immediately realize the evil consequences of what is to be done. Luxembourg's article does not mention what is to be done at all, and Trotsky's pamphlet confines its critique of what is to be done to a few passing pot shots at some of Lenin's obiter dicta. Both works aim their fire at Lenin's factional sins during and after the Second Congress in August 1903, and make no serious effort to trace these sins back to what is to be done. More importantly, if we listen to what Trotsky and Luxembourg actually say, we find that their anti-Lenin critique does fatal damage to the textbook interpretation. The most glaring example is the role of intellectuals, since both Luxembourg and Trotsky vigorously attacked Lenin for his hostility to intellectuals. In fact, as we shall see later, Trotsky and Luxembourg share many of the assumptions that the textbook interpretation sees as unique to Lenin's elitism. Meanwhile, one opponent of Lenin did produce an extensive reading of what is to be done that has been totally forgotten. In a series of articles in 1904 and 5, Alexander Potrasov, one of Lenin's fellow editors on Iskra and now a determined foe, analyzed what is to be done as the classic expression of the grandiose romanticism and self-deceiving optimism of the underground praktiki. These praktiki had a totally unrealistic idea of what they could accomplish and the mass support they could expect. True, Lenin severely chastised the praktiki, but, to use an anachronistic image to express Potrasov's thought, this was the pep talk of a coach at halftime, aimed at conveying the invigorating conviction to the team that it could do much, much better. As such, Lenin's sermons made him the hero precisely of these praktiki. Potrasov's hostile but perceptive critique brings out an important point. 
The thrust of the textbook interpretation is that Lenin's pessimism and distrust of the masses is a bad thing, although there are occasional compliments to his pragmatic realism. As a result, an interpretation stressing Lenin's confidence will ipso facto be considered pro-Lenin. The present study is neither pro-Lenin nor anti-Lenin. Its aim is to give an accurate account of Lenin's outlook and his empirical judgments. Potrosov opens the possibility that Lenin's confidence was a mistaken view of reality that was capable of doing much damage. This possibility can only be assessed in the course of a full-length consideration of Lenin's entire career. Another extended analysis of what is to be done in 1905 came from the pen of a then-obscure Georgian praktik named Yosef Zhugashvili, Stalin. Stalin mounted an energetic defense of what is to be done against Menshevik critics who described it as anti-worker. Although Stalin was a fierce Bolshevik, his defense of what is to be done coincides with Potrosov's analysis on an essential point. Lenin was confident that the workers would heed the social democratic message. Stalin's essay was his contribution to the Bolshevik polemics of 1904 and 5 that was conducted by Lenin partisans such as Alexander Bogdanov, Mikhail Alminsky, M. Lyadov, and Vaclav Rovsky. The writings of these Bolsheviks do not defend anything remotely similar to what the textbook interpretation would predict their views to be. After 1905, Russian social democracy moved on to other issues and other crises, and what is to be done was never discussed, even by its author outside the context of party history. Looking back, Lenin's closest lieutenants and first biographers, Grigory Zinoviev, Lev Kamenev, Nadezhda Krupskaya, saw what is to be done as an outstanding and characteristic product, but certainly not as a breakthrough or a charter document of Bolshevism. Zinoviev's recollection serves as a good introduction to our account of the dispute between the Orthodox and the Economists. Quote, The Economist critics would say, so what, in your opinion, is the working class? A messiah? To this, we answered and answer now. Messiah and messianism are not our language, and we do not like such words. But we accept the concept that is contained in them. Yes, the working class is, in a certain sense, a messiah, and its role a messianic one, for this is the class which will liberate the whole world. We avoid semi-mystical terms like messiah and messianism and prefer the scientific one, the hegemonic proletariat. End quote. The role of what is to be done in later Bolshevism is perhaps best illustrated by a representative of a younger generation than Zinoviev's, namely Nikolai Bukharin, who joined the party after 1905, that is, after the what is to be done episode had come and gone. If there is a single reference to what is to be done in all of Bukharin's writings, I have not yet found it. What is to be done, for example, is missing from the extensive reading list provided for the up-and-coming Bolshevik in the party textbook ABCs of Communism that Bukharin co-authored in 1919. Bukharin twice wrote specifically about Lenin's status as an original theorist and his contributions to Marxism. What is to be done is not mentioned either time. In fact, the whole topic of party organization is not taken up. After the Bolshevik Revolution, informed outsider observers described Lenin in terms that are incompatible with the textbook interpretation. The American journalist W.H. Chamberlain, author of the classic study The Russian Revolution, wrote in 1930 that boundless hatred for the capitalist system and its upholders, boundless faith in the right and ability of the working class to dominate a new social order. These were certainly the two dominant passions of Lenin's strong and simple character. In the late 1930s, the Soviet government issued a fundamental textbook of party history, usually referred to as the Short Course. The sections on the Iskra period are by Stalin personally. Stalin's interpretation of what is to be done differ from the Western textbook interpretation in two fundamental respects. First, he did not see what is to be done as the charter document of a party of a new type. To be sure, this term is used, but applied only to later developments. As for what is to be done, it brilliantly substantiated the fundamental Marxist thesis that a Marxist party is a merger of the worker movement with socialism. Stalin knew perfectly well that Karl Kautsky was the one who formulated this fundamental Marxist thesis, since he cited Kautsky's formula as the epigraph for his 1905 article. He knew perfectly well that this formula was an authoritative commonplace within international social democracy, since the whole brunt of his 1905 defense of what is to be done rests on this fact. And, because he knew these things, it did not occur to him to see what is to be done as the origin of a party of a new type. 
Stalin also challenges the worry about workers interpretation because he presents what is to be done as more confident about the workers than were foes of Lenin such as the economists. Why is it bad to bow down to spontaneity and to disparage consciousness? Answer, because to do so was to insult the workers who strive toward consciousness as to light. Furthermore, Lenin showed that to draw the working class away from the general political struggle against Tsardom was a crime because the workers wanted to fight not only for better terms, but also for the abolition of the capitalist system itself. Thus, I stand with Stalin against the academic and activist consensus. This is no doubt rather embarrassing. But for whom? For me, because I find myself on the same side with the man not known for scrupulous history writing, or for advocates of the textbook interpretation who are wrong when even Stalin, because of his roots in pre-war Russian democracy, was right. The textbook interpretation is thus, on the whole, a post-war creation. One reason for its rise is a great forgetting of what pre-war international social democracy was all about. The principal reason for this loss of context is the watershed of the 1917 revolution, which split pre-war social democracy in two and gave the name social democracy only to the more moderate side. On the left, a number of writers with no or very shallow roots in the Second International, George Lukács, Antonio Gramsci, Karl Korsch, created a theory, not shared by Lenin, that Leninism was the principled rejection of the fatalistic Marxism of the Second International and of Kautsky in particular. In my view, the insistence on seeing a great gulf between Kautsky on the one hand and Lenin, Luxembourg, and Trotsky on the other has condemned those in the post-war Trotskyist tradition to a deep misunderstanding of their own heroes. A similar forgetting occurred in the academic tradition, due in large part to the exclusive focus on Russia, resulting in a similar misunderstanding of the heroes of many in the academic tradition, namely the economists and the Mensheviks. Even in post-war scholarship, the textbook interpretation has not gone unchallenged. Two teachers of mine from the generation that created the textbook interpretation, John Plaminitz and Robert Tucker, saw the excitement and urgency underlying what is to be done. In recent years, persistent challenges to the textbook interpretation have continued to appear in the scholarly literature. I am indebted in particular to Moira Donald's study of Kautsky's overwhelming impact on Russian social democracy and to Henry Reichman's groundbreaking article that asks how what is to be done might have looked in the eyes of a militant worker of Lenin's time. Given the existence of two strongly contrasting views on such an important document, we would expect some sort of debate or attempts to convince one another. But not so. There was, neither then or later, any sort of extended academic debate about the meaning of what is to be done. Advocates of the textbook interpretation simply took no cognizance of any respectable challenge to their interpretation. As stated earlier, it is difficult to find any argued analysis of what is to be done in the Iskra period monograph cycle or in the historical literature generally. None of the challengers took on the job of putting what is to be done into historical context or explaining the striking passages that gave prima facie plausibility to the textbook interpretation, combating spontaneity, consciousness from without, diverting the worker movement, and the like. This is where the present study comes in. Commentary and Translation The present commentary is divided into three parts. Part 1 examines the outlook of Marx-based social democracy. After introducing the term Erfurtianism as a label for that outlook, I argue that Lenin was a Russian Erfurtian who saw Russian social democracy as one episode in a larger overarching narrative. Within Russian social democracy, Lenin was a member, from 1900 to 1903, of the editorial board of the underground newspaper Iskra. Since both friends and foes of what is to be done saw it as a classic expression of Iskraism, I devote a chapter to explaining the outlook of Iskra and its reaction to the growing revolutionary crisis in Russia. Part 2 examines the immediate polemical context of what is to be done by looking at Lenin's significant others, that is, the Russian Social Democrats against whom he defined his own position in what is to be done. The key questions in all these disputes is the usefulness of the SPD model under Russian conditions and, in particular, the chances for a successful spread of social democratic awareness. In every dispute, Lenin is found insisting on a rapid spread of awareness that would become even more rapid if the social democrats shaped up. Part 3 examines the world of what is to be done, the view of the world implicit in its arguments and the source of its organizational proposals. 
The social democratic underground, as it evolved in various localities in the 1890s, had set itself the task of combining the secrecy needed to survive police prosecution with the presence of genuine roots in the worker milieu. Lenin's contribution was to make explicit the norms of this newly created institution, and then to promise the praktiki that they could accomplish miracles if they observed these norms. In a final chapter, I survey the Bolshevik-Menshevik dispute of 1904. What is to be done played a much smaller role in this episode than is generally realized, and I had not originally planned to discuss it at length. I eventually came to see that clarity about the real issues underlying the Bolshevik-Menshevik split in 1904 was a necessity, given the iconic status of Trotsky and Luxembourg as critics of what is to be done. A new translation of the entire 1902 text of what is to be done is appended to the commentary. One may well ask, why is a new translation needed? There now exist four different English translations of what is to be done. The first one was done in 1929 when Lenin's works were issued by the Soviet government in English, German, and French. The English version was done by Joe Feinberg, a Russian-born British leftist who returned to Russia soon after the revolution. He gave a report on the British situation at the founding congress of the Communist International in 1919. Feinberg made the basic translation choices that have governed how English speakers have read what is to be done ever since. In 1962, the Soviet government issued Lenin's complete works in English. For this edition, Feinberg's translation was revised by George Hanna, whose changes are usually, but not always, for the better. Finally, a Penguin translation edited by Robert Service was published in 1988. Service tinkered further with the Feinberg Hanna translation, and his changes are also sometimes an improvement. Meanwhile, the only translation of what is to be done independent of the Feinberg tradition was published by Oxford University Press in 1962. Sentence by sentence, this translation by S. V. and Patricia Udichin is superior to the other translations. Unfortunately, as a scholarly edition, the Udichin translation is a failure. Not only is it abridged, but the passages left out are precisely those that might have caused trouble for Udigen's own interpretation. So, we now have three synoptic translations, Feinberg, feinberg Hanna, and feinberg Hanna Service, plus the translation according to Udigen. All four are aimed at making Lenin's texts readable and understandable without extensive commentary. As such, there is much to recommend them. They are accurate for the most part, and they often succeed admirably in rendering Lennon's passionately convoluted sentences into usable English. The version provided here is a new one translated directly from the Russian text, and yet I am glad to acknowledge my debt to earlier translations. The fact remains that what is to be done simply is not understandable without an extensive commentary. The present translation therefore pursues a different goal, consistency and clarity in the rendition of key terms. This goal requires, first, motivated translation choices for key terms, second, it requires that a Russian term always be rendered by the same English word and that no English word be used to render more than one Russian word. Third, insofar as possible, closely related Russian words should be translated in such a way that the link between them is clear. These requirements could not always be fully met, but the closer the translation comes to the goal of consistency and clarity in the rendition of key terms, the more commentary-friendly it is. A central example of my translation goals is the contrast between consciousness and spontaneity. This contrast is crucial for the textbook interpretation, and yet no one restricted to the English text can have an adequate grasp of it. On the one hand, the English word consciousness translates two related but distinct Russian terms, saznanya and saznatinist. After much consideration of Lenin's usage of these terms, I have decided on awareness for saznanya and purposiveness for saznatinist. On the other hand, the Russian word rendered by spontaneity, stihinist, is also sometimes rendered in its adjectival form as elemental. I have thrown up my hands on this one and simply retained the Russian words stihinist, since the term is simply too contentious and idiosyncratic for me to impose an interpretation via translation. In the existing translations, then, one English word, consciousness, represents two distinct Russian words, while one Russian word, stihini, is represented in English by two distinct terms, spontaneous and elemental. The English language contrast, consciousness versus spontaneity, thus seriously distorts what is going on in Lenin's text. Sometimes the existing translations muffle even the existence of a key term. Take the Russian word konspiristia. It does not mean conspiracy. 
it refers to all the rules and procedures needed to enable an underground organization to survive. The fine art of not getting arrested. The earlier translators were certainly aware of this general meaning, and usually render conspiristia as secrecy or some such general term. Given that there is no term in English remotely similar to conspiristia, secrecy is in many ways a defensible translation choice. Nevertheless, the result is unacceptable for anyone interested in a genuine engagement with Lenin's text via the English translation. According to the textbook interpretation, Lenin and what is to be done advocates a conspiratorial form of party organization. How can we seriously assess this claim when the very term, conspiristia, is hidden from view? What is more, conspiristia was a key term in the vocabulary of Russian revolutionaries. It had an emotional and even romantic aura. Much of Lenin's argument revolves around the need for inculcating a culture of conspiristia. The term must be restored to view. Since it is a foreign word transliterated into Russian, I have found it simplest just to transliterate it back and keep it as conspiristia. In other cases, a translation choice that is too obvious can be severely misleading. Prafishia is such a faux ami. This word often means trade, as in professionalni soyuz, the standard term for trade union. As such, proficia plays an important role in the rhetoric of what is to be done, since Lenin takes over Kautsky's argument that economic struggle tends to focus on particular trades, while political struggle unites an entire class. But proficia also turns up in Lenin's most celebrated coinage, Rivalusania po profici. This is always translated revolutionary by profession or professional revolutionary, but I believe we should respect the verbal link in Lenin's text and translate as revolutionary by trade. In chapter 8, I will show why this more prosaic rendering is closer to Lenin's intention. Other foamies are tredunianism and bourgeoisie démocratie. A glossary contains all the renderings that differ significantly from earlier translations and points the reader to relevant discussions in the commentary. The translation is provided with two sets of annotations of approximately equal size. One set is devoted to two paragraphs, the other set is devoted to the rest of the book. The two paragraphs are what I call the scandalous passages, the endlessly recycled sentences about from without and combating spontaneity. These are the heart of the textbook interpretation. For reasons given at the beginning of chapter 7, I bracket the scandalous passages during the course of my commentary and build my interpretation without using them one way or the other. In Annotations Part 2, I open up the brackets and give these two paragraphs the close reading they need in order to be understood. What is to be done has five chapters, and each chapter is broken up into several sections that are the real building blocks of the book. In Annotations Part 1, I proceed section by section, explaining the key assertions and how they fit into the larger argument. I also provide such background information as is necessary for understanding Lenin's text. Some readers may find it useful to get a sense of what Lenin's book is all about by perusing the section-by-section -section annotation before plunging into the commentary, since the commentary does not get to what is to be done itself until part 3. That is the end of the introduction to Lenin Rediscovered. Uh, I think Lee does a pretty good job of outlining exactly you know, what arguments he's going to make about the text of what is to be done and about Lenin's outlook in general. There are eight hundred more long, detailed, incredible pages of analysis and translation dedicated to precisely this, and I will spend the next few months of my life narrating an audiobook for it, which I am so excited to do. I'm a huge fan of Lee and all of his work, including his shorter biography of Lenin, which I definitely recommend. Uh, also recommend actually buying Lenin Rediscovered and reading through it. I won't be doing any of the footnotes uh, or supplementary material that's included in there, and that stuff is great as well. So try and get a copy of that from Haymarket. I don't think there's too much more to say here, except that I promise I'm going to do a good job <laughs> with the audiobook. Um, I'm definitely open to feedback. You know, if there's any suggestions that, that any of y'all have based on this reading of the introduction, I guess I probably should plug the GoFundMe unless you got here from the GoFundMe, in which case, thank you. And if not, please go there. Because uh, I need to pay my bills for the months that I'm going to be working on this project and all support, whether it's donations or just sharing it on social media so we can find people for donations is super, super appreciated. I guess I'll close out with this quote from Lenin to illustrate my motivation in taking on this project. Uh, in 1905, Lenin said, quote, 
In the beginning, we had to teach the workers the ABCs, both in the literal and in the figurative senses. Now, the standard of political literacy has risen so gigantically that we can and should concentrate all our efforts on the more direct social democratic objectives aimed at giving an organized direction to the revolutionary stream. End quote. While, at least from my perspective, in the 21st century in the United States, it seems like we're light years away from a situation like that, I know that a lot can happen in a relatively short amount of time, and it's my sincere hope that this audiobook will be some small contribution towards getting us to that point. I consider Linden Rediscovered a crucial text for understanding where we're at, what we need to do, and where we need to be going for the U.S. socialist movement, and I'm sure it's relevant to socialist movements abroad. With that in mind, I consider producing this audiobook both my duty and my pleasure as a communist, and I truly appreciate your support. Ich verbinde